Hello everyone. In this short video, we're going to be talking about the phosphoinositide pathway, which produces three different secondary messengers, inositol 145 triphosphate also known as IP3, calcium, as well as DAG, 1,2-diacylglycerol. All right? It requires a receptor, and the receptor is composed of seven transmembrane segments. It also it activates a heterotrimeric G protein. Um, a specific kinase is necessary as well, and a phosphorylated glycerophospholipids. All right. And the phosphoinositide pathway mediates the effect of a number of different hormones, right? So what happens is that a signaling molecule binds to the receptor protein, which is composed of seven different transmembrane helices. The binding of the signaling molecule to the receptor triggers conformational changes within the cytoplasmic end of that um, receptor, which then activates a heterotrimeric G protein to replace or displace its bound GDP by GTP, thereby activating it, which will then trigger the alpha subunit to dissociate from the gamma and the beta subunit, right? And the alpha subunit will then bind to phospholipase C, right? Once the alpha subunit of the heterotrimeric G protein is bound, to the phospholipase C, it activates it, which triggers the hydrolysis of PIP2, and we'll take a look in a second, into DAG and into IP3, right? Now, IP3, so DAG is one of the three um, secondary messengers that are produced. IP3 is the second secondary messenger that is produced, and then the third one is calcium, because IP3 binds to an IP3-gated um, calcium um, transport channel within the ER of the membrane, which triggers in turn, which activates it and triggers the transport of calcium from the lumen of the ER into the cytoplasm or into the cytosol. When calcium now is in the cytosol that it will have two outcomes basically, either binding to calmodulin, which binds four calcium ions, and we'll take a look at its structure in a minute. But once calcium binds to calmodulin, it will f activate kinases, right? And it will activate kinases by really binding to the regulatory subunit of that kinase, causing its release or its conformational changes that causes the regulatory subunit to dissociate from the catalytic subunit, much like FOS, um, similar enough to protein kinase A. And once that kinase is activate, it will phosphorylate a number of different proteins, which will cause, which will activate a number of different cellular proteins. But c calcium can also bind to protein kinase A. And what activates protein kinase A is DAG. Right? DAG helps anchor protein kinase A to the membrane, which activates it. Right? And then once calcium is bound, it becomes active and it will activate a number of different proteins. Notice it is a kinase. And that magnitude of the signal can also be limited by um, the conversion of IP3 into IP2 through an enzyme known as inositol polyphosphate 5 phosphatases. All right, so the binding of a signal to its receptor triggers conformational change within the cytoplasmic end, which causes, which activates the G protein. Once it's active, its alpha subunit will dissociate from its gamma and beta subunit, which will activate phospholipase C. Once phospholipase C, known as PLC, is activated, it will convert PIP2 into DAG and IP3. IP3 activates a calcium channel within the ER that will then bind to calmodulin, activating a number of kinases, or bind to protein kinase C that is now associated with DAG and activated as well. All right, so 
Phospholipase C is the enzyme that is catalyzing the hydrolysis of phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate or PIP2 into diacylglycerol or DAG and IP3 inositol 1,4,5-triphosphate, right? DAG helps anchor protein kinase C to the membrane, thereby activating it, whereas IP3 binds to a calcium channel within the ER, um, thereby releasing calcium into the cytosol, which can bind to calmodulin, which can then activate a number of different kinases. Okay, and here's an example of, or here's a, here's a structure of a comodulin, and it binds calcium uh, to a site that we refer to as the EF motif, right? Where you have a shorter helix and a longer helix, and calcium is bound right in between. Um, a comodulin molecule binds four different calcium ions. So then it has one, two, three, four five, six, seven different helices. Each calcium um, is coordinated right between two of them. And then you have a longer helix that acts much like a flexible linker, right? But that EF binding motif is common for calcium, where you have a shorter helix and a longer helix, and a calcium ion is bound right in between. Okay. Um, one example of how that longer helix can act as a flexible linker is shown where you have this methionine-rich hydrophobic um, patch that exposes it to the protein, right? And it is shown, you know, bound to a segment of a protein, right? So that longer helix is act, acting much like a flexible linker, and here's a different view of how it can bind to a different protein. And here's a better or easier example to perhaps look at. Now, when calcium is bound to comodulin, it will activate kinases. And here's an example of an inactive kinase that has a catalytic subunit and a regulatory subunit, where the regulatory subunit is binds to or interacts with the catalytic domain, but it binds at the same site where the substrate would have otherwise been bound, right? So it's basically auto-inhibiting the kinase. And what happens is when calcium comodulin interacts, it interacts with the regulatory subunits, causing a conformational change, right? That causes the regulatory and the catalytic subunits to dissociate from one another, thereby exposing that particular kinase or exposing the active site of that particular kinase where the substrate can now bind, thereby activating the kinase, and which will activate a number of different cellular proteins. Okay. And that's an example of that flexible linker, that longer alpha helix. All right, diacylglycerol or DAG um, was formed from um, the hydrolysis of PIP3 into DAG and IP3. Well, DAG helps anchor protein kinase C um, into the membrane, um, stabilizing its conformation. And here's an example of protein kinase C, which is shown in orange. It has two zinc binding domains, and between those two zinc binding domains, there is this net or loop, and that's where specifically um, DAG can bind and help anchor protein kinase C into the membrane, stabilizing its conformation. Right? Okay, I hope this was helpful.